All right, 500 startups. I've been looking forward to teaching this class since we wrote the case. <laughs> we have three special guests here, and I hope all of you will join me in welcoming Dave, Mojan, and Aaron from 500 Startups. I promised him you would all be polite and kind because he's such a sensitive guy. <laughs> all right. We'll start with some case facts, get them out of the way, and then I have five things I want us to go through as a team. Let's start first with what's going on. Well, who are they? They're simultaneously an investor and an accelerator. You're a floor wax and a dessert, dessert topping. topping. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> declining start. All the old people in the room get the joke. Um, declining startup costs. It costs much less to start a company. They have the ability to take advantage of this and, and pile into it. Initial check size, 50K to $100,000. They've made 800 investments at the time we wrote the case. Is that correct? About 880 right now. Okay, 880. And you know, if you look at the standard fund as talked about in the case, you might get somewhere between 25 and 40 investments in a typical fund. So they're playing the numbers game. They're going in hard and going in frequently. They like to invest when a company's got its MVP, maybe still is trying to figure out some of its product market fit, but they've got something that they're ready to launch on. They're trying to take advantage of exits that happen in the 20 to $100 million range and believe there's the ability to get returns in doing that, which is diametrically opposed to the venture capital model. Right? We heard that from Kevin last week. Right? He said, yeah, if you take out Uber, the returns look like this. But the whole point of venture is you want to have things like Uber, because right? that's what drives everything in terms of venture capital in the case of AngelList as well. We still think we're going to find a few unicorns. There you go. It's not that you would do it exclusively, but you think that you, you know, if you look at the breakdown, especially in the exhibits, right? you think you can build a good business with good returns and taking advantage of things that historically most institutional investors haven't been able to. International, the new frontier. Right? There's entrepreneurs all over the world. This internet thing is going to be big. They're able to break it down, use new technologies, and give people access to capital and resources. So at the time of the case, women were CEOs of 100 of 800 businesses, about 12.5%. Still not at the 50% mark of the population, but better than most venture capital firms would highlight. Probably close to 15 to 20% CEOs, probably 25 to 30% founders. Wow. All right. But still far below 50. All right. Um, strong push to take advantage of minorities and the opportunities to create for them because it's an untapped market. Racism is arbitrage. Okay. <laughs> well, it didn't take us long to get into something exciting, did it? <laughs> um, you look at his experience with Aslan. Interesting well, name choice. Way back. But it was about helping the less knowledgeable, right? If you looked at the things that he learned, to talk about being an authentic entrepreneur, what did Dave learn when he was running his company? He didn't know what to do. And that's what they're trying to break down with 500. The seed investing markets become hyper competitive. We see, again, we've done a whole week on this. Evolution versus revolution. 99% of the time improve other people's stuff. 1% of the time invent new stuff. Very valuation sensitive with the first money. For the model to work, you've got to get in at a good price so the 50 to 100K can actually be levered up. It's not a thunder lizard strategy. Does anybody know the phrase thunder lizard? <laughs> anybody? Mike Maples. Yeah, go ahead. Do you want to, what is a thunder lizard? It's something like the unicorn idea, yeah. just Mike Maples. Exactly. It's this idea if you want to find something that's really, really big. And so this is the anti- They're both mythical. That's the- uh, That's it. The smartest people in the world are chasing unicorns. They're not real. But doesn't that bother anybody that we're all chasing something that's not real? OK. You're a little irreverent. Has fun with what he does. And they do this thing called geeks on a plane. Part of that process of getting people out of the valley. If you follow Dave on Twitter, if you're friends with him on Facebook, I'm friends with Dave on Facebook, but that doesn't mean anything because he's got 1.2 billion friends on Facebook. <laughs> I swear to you, Dave is the hardest working person I've ever seen in the business. Oh, that's so not true. <laughs> he's always on a plane. He's always working hard somewhere. He's always traveling. All right, so here's my question. With that as background, this notion, it's, it's about volume. Can VC be operationalized? Can institutional investing be operationalized? What do you think? Dave says yes. What were all of your impressions having read the case? Who wants to kick us off? All of a sudden, everyone got shy. <laughs> I can cold call. You guys really better not suck this bad once I start talking. Exactly. Somebody, yes, Sergey. Well, I, I would say that you cannot do it completely, the whole VC model, but you can do some layers of that. 
So as far as as far as I see, uh, David managed to uh, operation, operationalize the, the, the first layer. <laughs> Kind of, yes, maybe. I'm a two-handed economist. On the one hand, yes, on the other. Yes or no? Can it be operationalized? Completely no. Completely no. Why? Why not? You'll get your chance. <laughs> you wait your turn. I say yes, because if the model is premised on, you know, one out of a hundred, then, you know, it, it's essentially a scattershot approach anyway. So if you apply just a modicum of basic judgment to, is this person smart? Does this idea make sense? Throw some cash at it and see where it goes. Spray and pray works. That's what you're saying. That's probably the most accurate description I've heard. <laughs> Tony. It seems that a, a lot of this model is linked to the exit valuations in that middle range, yes. which relies on an MA environment, which relies on people having the capital to buy those targets, okay. which may just not exist for five years at a time, in which case you just don't get those exits. Okay. So if you're at VC and you're always heading to sort of bigger deals, bigger IPOs, and everything else, then maybe that's more likely to carry on, whereas you, if you lose that middle part of the market, we'll come down. So if and only if we can get those, we can get those exits in this range. I think the uh, IPO market is also subject to dry spots as much as the M&A market. It's cynical as well, but at least if you're also getting those massive deals. The maybe IPO get market's time much more subject to weak spots than the M&A market. Right, we'll actually get, if we hit time, we'll get some data. We can show about correlation on stock market and acquisitions. Who else? Matters for international. Art. For me, the key here is kind of deal flow, and can they get good deal flow? And if the answer is yes, then it could operationalize VC. Um, I guess I just worried a little bit about adverse selection with them pushing for lower valuations and also targeting the kind of middle outcome versus if you had an entrepreneur who said, I want to do a $10 billion company, and that was the best guy, and therefore they just weren't a, a natural fit for it. So Kevin and, and Ash were here on Tuesday, and they were telling us of the three variables, Scott highlighted them, and the first one was team, right? So they're actually now going after people who haven't proven themselves yet. And so we, we only want shitty entrepreneurs. None exactly. Of you guys, none of you guys would qualify. You're too talented. Exactly, because they go to Stanford. Right? Yeah. Mr. Hill? That was supposed to be. Yeah, totally <laughs> I'm sorry? Yeah, I think what he is doing is a thinking that entrepreneurship or building a new business is a, just a ordinary stuff. We here, being tend to think building a new business is special, something different from other business. Right. But what he's doing is make the evolution, not revolution, right? Okay. So, and uh, find the small success a lot rather than finding a big home run. So he's not hunting here. He's hunting elsewhere. That's where the opportunities lie. So yes, you think it's it can be operationalized outside of this area? No. It, he, he, he's changing the, the, the structure game as a, a, a just a common game. I mean, it's entrepreneurship is not a special business. It's just a way of business. I mean, okay. So. So do you think it can be operationalized then? Yes. There's another hand that's up over here. David. So I, I think the. Uh, uh, the spray and pray type strategy it works in efficient markets, and as long as you can find places where the market is inefficient, uh, it works great. So underserved segments such as women, international, uh, uh, first-time uh, founders or founders without a great track record, anywhere you see markets, fantastic. Don't they tell us in venture you're looking for proprietary deal flow or, or institutional investors you're looking to tap in those areas where people aren't hunting, and that's what they're doing. So you think this actually could work? Anybody disagree? Jonathan? Um, if you stick to the traditional VC business model, this is, cannot be operationalized. But as you said, um, the 500 startups have a massive uh, network in the world. You already had 1.2 billion friends in the uh, Facebook. And <laughs> 500 startups have a lot of business partners in, um, in the emerging market now in the uh, United States. So that network can enable the uh, operational uh, yeah, model in the area. OK, so you're, you're another one who says this is a good idea if you hunt where it's not. Does anybody think this is a bad idea? Awesome. Actually, I, I think about this in the following way. If you want to operationalize something, you need to actually commoditize it somehow. So you need to have a square framework, and you need to put everything through this framework. Okay. And I actually doubt that you can do 
because they need to start up something like that. So the All right, Richard, and then Mark. Yeah, I think it depends on the economical cycle, and if we are if we are in a uh, race economical cycle, mm -hmm. I think this is working. And if we are in a down cycle, I think it's not working. Absolutely, it's not working. Really? Some of my best investments were 2009. Actually, st statistics will tell you the best companies are formed when economics are bad because they're more resilient. I'm going to go Mark and then I'm going to go over here. So, Mark? So, so uh, you use the word commoditization and, and uh, I I think that's kind of a strong word, but I think it's a very important thing to think about. The cost of starting up today has declined dramatically. I think, I don't remember the quote from too many, but I think in 1999, it cost around $5 million to take a, a, a company from start to, to market. Today, it's like, what, $50,000 less, $5,000? And so that means the traditional VC model doesn't work. There has to be a change. And, and, and I think what, what Dave is doing is capitalizing on the fact that the inputs going into making the sausage have, have become you know, much, much cheaper. Okay. Jessica? Um, in some ways, this reminds me of like banks buying up some prime mortgages before 2008, in that a lot of risky bets don't make them inherently less risky. I love how shitty you think I'm business. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You'll get your chance. I promise. <laughs> So, so this is basically, he's just bundling up stuff. It's CDOs. You're in the CDO business. The really baby. crappy ones. Exactly. The really bad ones. Yeah. All right. Okay, well, okay. She's basically saying, she, bundling the dregs, we throw one good one in, and we say, look. You didn't have to throw a good one in. Wait, wait, is that any different than my business as a VC? I get a lot of dregs, and if I have one good one, it's like I'm a genius. Yeah, he doesn't want the good one, though. He wants the. Oh, yeah, that's right. We don't want it. Mark, <laughs> there was somebody else had a hand up here. Zane, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, I guess um, taking a step back, what does it mean to actually operationalize something? I think the Great consensus question. in the room means to scale, but that's only my assumption. Okay. If that is the case, then they're doing it right now. I, I don't think there's a question of whether they're actually scale, like operating in the VC context. Okay. The question is, are they doing it well? Yeah. And in order to do that, we have to go back to their IRR, uh -huh. which Dave says other VCs get killed on. And then I go back to what have been their exits to date. How are and his returns so far? So it looks like Dave made a post on Quora saying that they had like three big exits, mm -hmm. like wildfire off the Google, et cetera. It looks like those had enough volume to probably generate good returns. Mm -hmm. But then I think Richard had raised the point economic cycle. And I imagine that a lot of funds that were raised in the 2009 to 2011 timeframe ended up returning good returns. Yeah, if we look at Exhibit 7, there are some pretty decent multiples that, that, the, that they've done so far. I think even Dave would probably admit it's early, but you know, they're starting to show some returns. <laughs> Ralph? Well, what I was going to say is, I think I agree with the point that in order to scale this up, you need some form of standardization. But um, if you think about it, they're both an incubator and the DC, and by being incubators that can train them while they're young kind of thing, uh -huh. so you might actually enable that standardization, which helps the business model. That He's very fast. getting deal flow. Isn't that brilliant? All right, so I want to keep this moving. Number two, if I'm a venture capitalist, and Dave's written, hurry up and die already, you friggin' <laughs> pathetic dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> I got that right. That earned right? me a lot of uh, friends. <laughs> what do I think of this? What do I think of what 500 Startups is doing? As somebody in the ecosystem, how do I feel about this? I think you're building Ferraris and he's building Volkswagens. You know, they're going after cheap small guys and lots, big volume, and you're going after the unicorns, or maybe not quite so far out, and focus on that part. So it's a, it's a different market. I don't think it's coexisting. Anybody disagree with that or agree with that? Nick? It, it kind of reminds me of like what like Mark Bagoff does when he like wanting to get uh, kind of like a brand around Salesforce. And one of the big things in the case was sort of building a really big brand. And this gets the entrepreneur's attention. So I think this is a good thing or a bad thing? If I'm a VC. Well, as a VC, if you see it like that, then it's just sort of a, it's the way to build a brand. And so <coughs> really... he's just making noise to get attention. Yeah. Hmm. 
John? It wouldn't bother me because at the end of the day, you still got to walk the walk. So you can tell me, you know, hey, you suck. I want you to die. Good. It's all good. Yeah. Okay. I hope you're right. Amir? Uh, I, I quite agree with John. I think it's the same industry. It's just a different way of reaching the same end goal. Yeah, but but, but, but Irv, these are BWs. No, but, these are Ferraris. But we had phase one, we had phase two, we had phase three. Who doesn't know there will not be a phase four and then a phase five, which is $10 billion? What do you want so to it, get there? So it's a comp it's, they're a competitive, yeah. competitive source of capital. OK. Matt? Um, so I think that it matters where you are as a VC. So if you're a VC outside of Silicon Valley, you're probably very concerned. Um, but in the Silicon Valley, maybe less concerned. And if I'm outside, why am I concerned? Just because there's a, it's a new source of capital that, and likely outside the Silicon Valley, there's fewer options. So this, is, in the same way that Angelus was, this is just you know bringing it, um, a huge new source of capital to the market. How many days a year do you travel? Uh, probably at least I'm out of the country probably half the time, maybe slightly more than half, but at least five, six months. How many institutional investors leave the Bay Area <laughs> you know, that often? He's coming to get you, so if you're outside, you be careful. Here comes Dave. Here yeah, comes but, 500. I mean, that's a misnomer. I mean, we have people who work for us who live 100% of their right. time outside the Bay Area in Mexico and Brazil and China and in India and in Malaysia and yeah. in Middle East. So. Okay, so I want to come back to this notion of VWs versus Ferraris. Let's assume that they get a company going. Let's assume that it's doing well. Where do you go for the next round of capital? Mo Phil! <laughs> Phil wants it! That's what I've been trying to say, this exact point, is that they don't care. And what they're doing is, and it's kind of the same problem I had for Angel's List, Angel List is he's creating a, a procurement process, and he's, he's, he's basically giving a lot of people a chance. And, following his own model and reinvesting in winners, and then when it becomes a winner, sends them to a demo day, and as an institutional investor, you show up to those, and you put money in those as well, and you invest alongside them. Dave is probably not leading C's and D's. He's probably leading you know, some seed, maybe an A, and then getting out even B, not even A. Yeah. And I, hold on, hold on. Hurry up and die already, you friggin' pathetic dinosaur. Wait a minute, ah, 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 ah. Die, you friggin' pathetic dinosaurs. Yeah. I mean, and now I'm leading the next round. Great way to you establish. You don't get anything else. Great you don't way to get establish to, a partnership. You don't get to follow on. <laughs> you don't get, ah, sorry, I don't care. You told me to die. You don't, you don't get your pro rata. Right? There don't might, you run the risk of pissing off the downstream? There might be a little bit of that. There might be a there little, might be bit, a little of bit of that. Yeah. Have you tweeted about that recently? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> if you piss off the downstream capital, what might they do? All right. No rofer for you. No soup for you. Exactly. Is Stacy? Well, I was going to say, maybe this is saving the obvious, but isn't this a classic low end disruption? Like Clay Christensen's model with the rebar. So, like, he's taking them in, and then he's going to get the second round and the third round because he already has his established relationships. So, the worry actually isn't that this is a low end disruption to start. The question is, what happens if he's right? And what happens if it continues to build? And what happens if the model keeps working and how it might matter in 5, 10, 15 years? Is that what you're proposing? So I should worry about them. Ah. Lakshmi? And there was a hand over here. I'll come to you after. As a traditional VC, you can bring three things to the table. Funding, people, and your expertise. And my question mark is, that, you know, could, could they, as you go through this, uh, in the analogy of sausage, you build bigger and bigger, could all those three be acquired by, 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 by startups? I don't know. So what do you think? As a result, I don't think you should be... The, the only thing I would be concerned about is if they can't affect your deal flow, that's the only question mark I would have. And if that's the case, I'd be slightly worried. Uh, but they need to come to you at some point if, they, if this becomes a, a, a real big company to get the next round of funding. Right, there was a hand over here to move on. Okay. Sheesh. Yeah, I, I wouldn't worry about it as a VC because um, I would see this as a sign of changing times. So earlier, uh, I think, uh, as Mark said, that it was much higher to start up. It, it would cost a lot, and now it doesn't cost as much. So it is actually a good thing because somebody is going to go out there, uh, verify what is worth working on, and then eventually, where do they go? They come to the VC. So I think it, it's actually a good thing because now I don't have to work so hard uh, you know, finding these small deals which could be good enough. Somebody's going to do all of He'll that work for me. me, come to me, and then eventually okay. get funded. 
So let's shift gears here then. 500 Startups is proposing this model that we're going to get in early, we're going to do it to scale, and another really, really smart dude in the valley writes, no, 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 no. I've seen it in my accelerator. I've seen it in Y Combinator. What matters is thunder lizards. This is how the money's made. This is, you know, if you went to the link that was in the study questions, because I know you all read the study questions, <laughs> right? We asked you to read the Black Swan post. Paul says, huh, huh, you've got to find your Airbnbs. You've got to find your big ones, because that's where the money's made. Who's right, Dave or Paul? And why, Phil? I think they're. I think Paul's talking past Dave, actually, and he's not even really. I think it, it's they're not even meeting in the middle. Paul's coming up with something and saying, uh, "Yeah, you got to invest in unicorns and thunder lizards." Well, Dave is doing that, believe it or not. He's just doing it earlier on. And so, the fact is, is that any one of his companies could be in it. Like YC, look at YC, right? And so you look at YC, and you're like, they're kind of doing this similar thing here, and they're investing in a lot of companies at once, and they've made unicorns, so it's hindsight. Unicorns only hindsight. Dave, 500 is also an accelerator, just like Y Combinator. Paul's saying all that matters is getting the big ones through the accelerator. Dave's saying, no, 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 you're missing the numbers. Right. Who's right? Well, again, I'm giving you a dollar. Who are you going to give it to, Paul or Dave? Uh, Paul or Dave? Dave? I'll give it to Dave. Why? Because oh. it's going to go further. You can split it up. I might turn around and give it to Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Who else on this? Jonathan? I think both of them is right. Because to win the battle, you need to, well, sometimes you need to use the uh, crude muscle, and some, sometimes you need to use the weapon for mass destruction. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, do I get to be the WMD or the WMD? <laughs> But you can't simultaneously pursue both of these strategies. If you have one dollar of scarce capital, who do you want to give it to? Who's right? Who's right and how do we know? I would probably go with Dave because I feel he's diversifying his risk. So. Okay. So, so Dave's diversified his risk how? I mean, he, he's going beyond the U.S. to different markets. How else? Uh, he's investing in startups uh, where you have women, women founders. Good. Minorities. Minorities. Paul says, yeah, that's all nice. I'm looking for my think, thunder uh, lizards. I think Sam's coming after those two. <laughs> Madhav, and then I'll come back to you. Yeah, I think, I think there's also an inherent assumption, I think Bob just made earlier, that somehow being an entrepreneur is something special. And maybe it isn't. Maybe it's just, look, you have a couple of people that can basically do some, some, some basic math, have a decent idea. Let's go fund as many of those people as we can. One of them's going to turn into, because the difference between, between Dave and Paul's philosophy is somehow, I believe Paul, you have to assume that he is better at finding unicorns than everybody else. Mm -hmm. Whereas Dave's philosophy is, OK, they're not, they're not, you know, they can stand up and not fall flat on their face. I'm going to fund them. And somebody in there is probably going to be a unicorn. So it does feel like it's a little safer to do that because we're not that special. Strangely accurate. <laughs> Lisa. One thought maybe against Dave's model is um, when you're investing in a company and you, you know, you're investing in a ton, um, if you decide to like, let that company get acquired, maybe it doesn't become the unicorn or the thunder loser that it could have been. So you know, maybe you're, like, you're basically like giving up a lot of the, the upside that you could have been getting if you had taken a more long-term deal. So he might be leaving money off the, off, on the table. And someone with, the, with the, what I'm describing as the Paul Graham model might be able to let it ride a little bit longer. OK, I'm going to go up here to, uh, sorry, Vinzi, Jesse. I, say, I was confused because normally you're over there. <laughs> um, I think just another distinction is between picking winners versus creating winners. And I think it's like recognizing that if you get to an early stage group of talented people that you're really building a brand. It's a lot like the wine industry. Like, what's the difference at really early stage between the best and the worst? It's all about signaling and brand and all that. And so you're bringing people, and the more people you can bring into this 500 startups brand, then you've kind of, and I think Dave recognizes the power of brand and marketing and stuff. And so I think he's going to be creating more winners uh, rather than just picking the right winners. Hmm. 
Are you creating winners or picking winners? Uh, trying to attract winners and trying to make a few people better. I'd just like to read the blurb that comes up on Google when you Google Y Combinator. Twice a year, we invest a small amount of money in a large number of startups, most recently 68. So yeah. I think the point is that Paul is Dave. It's Paul, Paul is Dave. <laughs> That's insulting to Paul. <laughs> These are the droids you're looking for. <laughs> but yet, Paul has a very different message than Dave as to how he's going to make money for his LPs. Right. Yeah, I think the point is it's just, the same it's just a message. It's the same approach. Mm. Mark? So I'll, I'll add to that and also to what Madoff said. Um, entrepreneurs are still very special people. Uh, there's just more of them now uh, because the cost of starting up is so much <laughs> Special as in Olympics or snowflakes? Yeah. Entrepreneurs, <laughs> entrepreneurs are the same as anybody else, whether they are management consultants, or working at hedge funds, or your barista at Starbucks, <laughs> everyone's the same. Are you telling me that they're special? I, I am saying absolutely. It takes a, a lot of naivete and balls to go off and do your own thing. He just called you intellectually lazy. Would you care to respond? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think, I, I think, doesn't that make me special? I'm specially lazy. <laughs> I mean, come on. Where's your your hand up? Uh, I was wondering how much of this is just uh, like retrospective rationalization, I and mean, it's all luck at the end of the day. It's all luck? I mean, like, if, if Dave had like, uh, you know, Dropbox or Airbnb exits, um, I wonder how that would have changed. So Paul got lucky. That's it. Paul just got lucky. I was really stupid turning down Uber. <laughs> really fucking stupid. In hindsight. Mr. Burkle. Well, I think the other thing is Paul's got better deal flow, coming back to what I was talking about. Uh, y Combinator just, is, it's been around longer. It's got a more prestigious brand. They're far more selective. And In the so US. It, what's that? In the US. In the US. He's not true. playing the same game. He's playing a different game, he would argue. Mm. He, Pieces. Pieces, right? But you're international and everything else. You're targeting yeah. different things. So the question is, is his deal flow inferior? Right now it is. Oh, anybody want to respond to this, Eric? Well, the, the previous point that I don't think YC was like YC when Airbnb and Dropbox were there. And so now that they've made it, they can go to their LPs and say, yeah, we were shooting these unicorns. But before you have that, you can't actually say that. So success begets success. Yeah, and then now the YC is you know, 70 companies. Then uh, Amazing change in perspective on YC between now and 2009, yeah. 10. All right. Like dramatic change. Show of hands. And again, this question of $1 to give to either Paul or Dave who have different investment strategies, even if they're doing something similarly. <laughs> yeah, you two need to be careful how you vote here. Okay? <laughs> Raise your hand if you want to give that $1 to Paul. Raise your hand if you want to give that to Dave. Holy shit, I have swayed you guys. You guys are stupid. Right. No. I'm going to call it 6535. For Dave. Wow. Can we, can we tell this to our LPs now? <laughs> it's on video, so there you go. You <laughs> if you were an entrepreneur. Can you ask that question again, but I'm like out of the room? <laughs> <laughs> we'll do it on Tuesday. Oh, close your eyes. There you go. Should entrepreneurs go to 500? It's crazy. It's nuts, right? You read the stuff, they're. they're they're partying and drinking all night in Ma downtown Mountain View, and it's chaos, and, and it's noisy, and it's messy, and it's... And, Rob, and are you in one of our batches? I am. <laughs> you just don't know it. <laughs> I'm one of the 800, 880 you funded. <laughs> would, would you go? If you're an entrepreneur, you want to go? Ashish, why? Oh, yeah. Why? <laughs> <laughs> there you go, dude. <laughs> why? Better, better question. You get the offer to go to Stanford GSB or 500. Which one do you take? Oh, we'll do that one in a second. Why do you want to go there first? And then we're going to make you answer the second one. Why do you want to go? So what I read over there was camaraderie, of more ideas, uh, more people to work with, and a lot of good talent. So, so that's how I interpret it, the way they have set up 500. OK, it's vibrant and fun. You think it's going to help you win? Yes, because I think. Uh, one, you get access to a lot of talent. You're sitting over there. If you're all by yourself, 
uh, and you're an entrepreneur, you're just starting, you know, you have limited ideas, you have limited resources, you have limited everything. Now out here, when you are in the middle of the action, with what everyone else is doing, you're learning. You're, you're not alone anymore. I think that that's one of the biggest challenges that entrepreneurs face. He just asked an awesome question. Should you go to Dave or should you come here? Right? Actually, let me rephrase that. Would you take the offer from Harvard or would you come to 500? Okay, I'll, I'll stick with your original question. Would you stick with Stanford? Ah, in all seriousness, in terms of becoming an entrepreneur, in terms of starting and growing a business and trying to put a dent in the universe, are you better off coming to business school or are you better off going to Dave? Kenny? Okay, so I think the accelerator is a really uh, interesting value proposition. So the thing that I am grappling with without experience in this area is uh, would I really give up 5% of my company for, for this? Especially when he is purposely looking for people who have not reached the product market fit stage so they can get a cheap valuation. So if he's only going to make a small bet, can I get the small bet somewhere, the, the small amount of capital somewhere else, like yeah. Kickstarter? I already have MVP. Can I crowdsource it, develop the idea further, and get a better valuation? Do I really want to give up 5% just like Better this? valuation is the more relevant question, not how much we take. Right. Tomas? No, I was thinking about like where you come here, where you go to HBS or you go to like 500 startup. I, I mean, if you're already starting a company, like if you can just like work, kind of like you're gonna waste a lot of time taking classes and stuff. So I think it's better to. <laughs> <laughs> if I think why not? You write that one down. <laughs> I'm holding one. If I think why not? Yeah. 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 And you're gonna wait. Oh, but but it's actually it's a legitimate question. Are you actually gonna get better real world? counsel and help from the team at 500 than you are here? It's a fair question. Nick? Something that like we're similar stuff we're talking about, like supplying the having growth hackers on site, uh -huh. things like that, because it seems like a lot of startups lose because they don't get the traction they need. And so if you're basically making a bet saying like, uh, you know, I don't know how sure I am as an entrepreneur, I'm a first timer, but I know I'm going to get support with getting the traction I need, that's a big thing. The question is like, how much of those resources do you actually get? Um, it's, it's a, it makes a big difference. Let's assume that his marketing materials are accurate. Their marketing materials are accurate. They do help. You've got growth hackers, you can get access to them. Where's Yin? Right? We saw a lot of activity when we were writing the cases. A lot of people there, lots of staff. We saw lots of entrepreneurs there. It was a pretty chaotic thing. Let's assume that it's there. So let's assume that he's delivering on his brand promise. You want to go there as an entrepreneur, Mata? I know we're not special because we're just entrepreneurs. <laughs> that's actually the problem. The fact that we're not special means, and, 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 uh, and like in any, in any startup scenario, a lot of us are going to fail. If I go to Dave um, and there's a high probability of me failing, and at the end of it, everyone's just going to recognize me as, yeah, I was just one in a big crowd of people because 500 just one's a whole big bunch of people. I don't think that sounds that special for whatever I'm going to go do next. But Stanford or Howard may give me at least a slightly more special. So song. you at least got this. You, you minimize your downside risk by getting the stamp on the forehead that you've got a Stanford degree. Whereas if we j if we if we mess it up going to 500, eh, no, you know what do we get? I was get? one of a thousand that messed it up. One of a thousand, 880, 800. head into a thousand. Vinod. I think we only accept 30 companies a batch. You guys actually probably accept several hundred people a quarter. I think you guys have the loose standards. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. How many people apply for your for each batch? That's 700. We take 30. Wow. Think about that. His selection criteria are about the same as the GSP. Vinod. Let me just widen my question. So, I was going to say if I had a choice between 500 and say Y Combinator. And if I'm an entrepreneur and I, and I feel like there's going to be an adverse selection in 500 just because they have a lower bar and anybody can get in, then I would try to get into YC. So, but you just said that. So follow-up question on that. Are you only going to apply to one of them? No, I would apply to as right. many. Yeah. How many but I, would, I, would, I think. So if you get the YC offer and you get the 500 offer, you'll take the YC offer. I, yeah. right. okay. How many have applied to more than one business school? Uh, OK. Other comments and thoughts on this? Let's see if there's anybody who hasn't gotten in yet. Do you write? Oh, over here, Sasha. Thank you. <coughs> I think there might be one risk of kind of groupthink. If you're just in, in that kind of environment, there's all these people around you kind of. I feel like if you were trying to be the unicorn, if you were trying to do, think independently and try and do something totally different from how other people are doing it, then you might risk kind of hitting you. So the risk is you, you copy exactly what everyone else is doing, but you copy their bad habits. 
Yeah, something like that. So I mean, you're influenced by how people are thinking around you. Are you influenced by your classmates? Yeah. And if you are you influenced by their bad habits? Probably. Okay, so why are their bad habits any better or worse than his <laughs> cohorts? It's a fair question, huh? Alex? I think if you're a serial entrepreneur, you want to be around people who are closer to real solving, closer to the problem they're trying to solve. And I think if 500 Startups is trying to get a diversity of people in there who are trying to solve problems, I mean, more diverse than a lot of people are sitting in this room, just because a lot of us have had the same sort of access and privilege and exposure to things. So if, you're, if, if it's truly the class is, is getting to where it's saying it wants to do, which is a diverse setting, you actually might have a culture that you're going to come up with more creative solutions than you would otherwise. So I might stand up here with Scott, and we might see a group that's actually pretty racially diverse. We might see a group that's gender diverse. But we're actually not that diverse in our backgrounds. And so you actually think that he might be pulling on a more diverse population, and that might be an advantage? OK. Hmm. Interesting. You going to go to him, Sergey? Uh, well, I have some experience in uh, collaborating with companies from 500 startups, YC, and TechCrunch. And what I see is that actually uh, from Y Combinator, people really get more help than, than from five startups. But uh, companies from five startups, they, they are leveraging the brand of five, uh, 500 startups. Uh, to get exposure to investors. Give me data behind that. Let's assume it's true, but show me the data that helps you make that point. Give, give us some examples, because not everyone may have those examples, the data behind that. Uh, so, for example, um, you were collaborating with one company in your previous batch, and uh, there was a person who was responsible for this company, and we were planning to invest into this company. We, have, uh, we had several uh, meetings with founders, and then we decided to approach the guy who was responsible for this company in, in 500 startups and ask him several questions. And this guy was supposed to help this company to grow during these three months. Uh, and the, we realized that he even didn't know some very basic information about the company, the business model and so on. So we were, we were really disappointed about that. But at the same time, the company finally... You can like name my name, actually, too. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you. Uh, but finally, the company attracted capital yeah. after the demo day. So they, they were leveraging the brand of our kind of startup to their capital. But that's so a good they, thing, isn't it? Yes, All right. but they didn't get maybe some help which would be really valuable for the company. If you're an entrepreneur in this room, show of hands, you're thinking of starting a company, how many of you would apply to 500? How many of you wouldn't? How many of you abstained? All right, last question. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Dave's larger than life. I would actually say that he's very genuine. I mean, you kind of, Dave is who Dave is. Is this a feature or a bug? You read the case, you know, we had to redact some things that were just kind of <laughs> wouldn't be good to put the Stanford brand on. A lot of vulgarities here and there. He's Dave. Feature or bug? John? I think it's a feature. It helps distinguish his brand and also maybe helps create some tailwinds for like the brands that go under him. I think it's probably more of a feature in the US where he needs that <laughs> and globally maybe less so because he doesn't need to be the non Y accelerator or whatever it is, Y Combinator. So I, I think it, it matters a lot more. So you see it as a US. good thing? Yeah. Okay. I see it as like a balancing feature to kind of the idea of like. 20 million to 100 million companies like they're like you want to like also get, get unicorns so you you turbocharge them you you put them in an environment where they get more amped up they get more excited and you kind of inject that energy that you have higher chances of unicorns so it's the straw that stirs the drink it's what makes it go other comments alex it seems slightly less um uh oh, it's, Y Combinator seems a little bit more elitist, I guess. And it seems by being out there in a personality, although it turns <laughs> off some people, it seems more approachable in some ways. So both as well, both as someone who thinks, well, like, you know, I'm, I, am I an actual entrepreneur? Am I going to get any funding from anybody? They may not go to Y Combinator. So you may actually have people coming out of the woodwork. 
Okay. Tyler? Uh, it's kind of on that point as well, but I think a lot of uh, either entrepreneurs view the venture capital as kind of this old, stodgy, um, just a little bit of stale environment. And I think entrepreneurs will come in in a hoodie and you know, sandals and shorts to meetings, and you see the kind of venture capital in a button. I'm not old, I wear jeans. You're pretty good at that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, you kind of just, your kind of look, your demeanor, kind of the, the casual nature of uh, your, how you present yourself, I think relates well to entrepreneurs um, and potentially would make uh, it seem more of a peer than kind of this almost not really trusted relationship where you can't uh, r relate well to the other side. So if VCs start wearing jeans and hoodies, does that kind of, you know, make us more like Dave? Uh, I feel like it would almost, it would, it would, um, if people did that because of, because of, you know, they saw you gain success, obviously I think that would, that would legitimize it, but I think, um, <laughs> yeah, it just seems like they, uh, there's, there's such a disconnect there, and I think kind of that style could be a positive aspect. Vinod? So, uh, I think the irreverence and all of that is definitely a feature uh, when it comes to being an entrepreneur and an investor, but I wonder what it is, whether it's a bug when it than it is as a manager of the company itself and or for fundraising. Or for fundraising. So those are yeah. I He's trying to raise a hundred million dollars. Do you trust this guy with twenty million of it? I want to take a fifth of his fund. Do I do and it? As a manager as well, that's something I wanted to know. How does it his employee? Yeah, we'll do that in the debrief. We're almost there. Ryan? So I personally uh, agree that a more approachable distinguished brand is a good thing. And uh, I think ultimately it's a feature, but one part that seems like a bug is we've been talking a lot about how as an entrepreneur you want to minimize risk. Mm -hmm. And honestly, like watching someone out there that could potentially say something that could really upset a lot of people um, might uh, create more risk than I can control. And so it's something that I would consider. If, if we Google Dave, you know, there's some videos out there that, that are, have caused challenges. Is that that would be a very All right. understatement, yes. If you're an entrepreneur, yeah. do I really want to be affiliated with Dave? Art? I think for me, net net, I like a lot, but I think the one risk I have is, we were talking about it earlier with the follow-ons, like I think the follow-on investments is the key to the business model because you have all these little bets and then you put a lot more behind the good ones and that's kind of what you're riding up to make a lot of money for the fund and that's how the return thing comes out of the appendix. Um, and so if they can't get the pro rata or even grow their stake, it's, it's really tough. Laura? I think at this moment in time, definitely a feature in terms of uh, having entrepreneurs self-select in. I think that the risk would be if down the line, you put your stake so hard in the ground to be able to pivot going forward, if, if it's harder to eat your words if they've been as strong as they are. If it's, oh, okay, now we do have our unicorn, now we want to look a little bit more like Y Combinator, now that we have some cred, that would be a harder shift to make if that's the intention. So it's good for now, but it can come back to bite you in the butt later. <coughs> hey, Ronnie. Right. Any other comments before I show something? It's weird. Yeah, back to your point about if I was a VC, if I was a VC and he was talking the way he did, I really wouldn't like it. And Why? Because he's threatening my job. He's basically threatening my job that is so easy right now because I have intel on these deals. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta tell you, it's not easy. I would make it. I would make an effort to squash him because I wouldn't want someone like him to come and take over deals like the big deals that he's gotten. Those should have been my deals. <laughs> I think it would make me like try to cut him out of the business. Have people tried to cut you out? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Tomas? Yeah. This may be more like a question. I understand that for like seed investment, but like VCs that do like more series A or B, this may be good because you, you get like deal flow from countries that you didn't even hear of. Okay. And so it's like, you can tell me like, fuck off or whatever, but if you bring me, if you need me, bring me deal flow, that's awesome. Like, you can tell I'm an asshole, but that's great. Okay, all right. Are there any other hands that I missed? You're an asshole with good deal flow, well. The, then you've got good deal flow and it's okay. <laughs> then you've got good deal flow. Exactly, all right. If we look at this case, I think it's very similar, obviously, to, to what we saw with AngelList. And if you think about the flow of the course, for all of you, I'd like you to look at this at two levels. The first is, is this a business model that makes sense? You, we have an entrepreneur who saw an opportunity and, tried to, and has tried to figure out, are there inefficiencies in the system? Can I go in and make something happen that's different? And time will tell if whether or not 500 is going to be continue to be successful and really put a dent in the universe. I think we also see an entrepreneur who's very authentic. 
very authentic to this market and who he is. Uh, I happen to be a huge fan of the quote that's at the beginning of the case. Late bloomer, not a loser. And so here I am, still standing in the arena, in hand-to-hand -hand combat with demons mostly of my own making, aiming to make a small dent in the universe. Nowhere near a great success story, yet fighting the good fight and perhaps helping others to achieve greatness as I attempt a bit of my own. I'll be 46 in a month, well past the age that most folks have already shown what they're made of, but I'm still grasping at the brass ring. Whether the style works for us or doesn't work for us, what we can say about Dave, and I said it earlier, is he works harder than anybody I've ever seen in the business. What's my proof of that? These are three random screenshots from Dave's page. Some folks whine how frivolous Facebook and Twitter are, but social media lets me share my life with friends all over the world. Hashtag thankful. No greater president waking up to my daughter, crawling into bed, snuggling and singing holiday carols in my ear. Priceless. What else does Dave share with us? <laughs> this is another one of my favorites. Kids are psyched. Just got their custom Minecraft ukuleles from Bohemian Guitars. Finally, his Twitter feed. Many days of travel makes one night of snuggles with my kids a precious gift. Something about Dave that's also quite endearing. That when you see how he acts and how he behaves, and we talk about him being an authentic leader, I think this is part of what makes the energy work. Is that he can use bad words here or there. He can be a bit bombastic. But the reason I think he gets such loyalty is he's willing to go out there and put himself out there in ways that most people won't. And even if you don't know Dave well, sometimes you feel like you do. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in welcoming Dave McClure. Wow. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do next, actually. <laughs> well, so what would be helpful is if you could comment on the things that you heard from the students, sure. what you agreed with and disagreed with, and then yes. maybe take some Q&A. Um, yeah, so I, I feel very lucky. A lot of times people talk about us like we've already made it, and I still feel like we're still trying to work hard to make sure we make it. Um, and uh, well, John and Aaron can probably tell you there's still a lot of things that are very rough around the edges. Um, I generally think the investment model is working fine. I don't really have too many concerns about that. And external criticism is like, you know, kind of washes off my back on that regard. Uh, things like this gentleman said, like, I really kind of want to go ask him, like, who is that person? Are they still on the team? <laughs> and are we still fucking that up? Uh, that, yeah, so that actually concerns me when I feel like, you know, yeah, there's somebody had a bad customer experience. I want to find out how to fix that. Uh, hopefully that's not happening at an empirical sample scale. Um, yeah, I feel really lucky. I mean, just being around and being able to survive this long is uh, an incredible sort of thing. It was not guaranteed at all four or five years ago. So, you know, we're about 40 people now, about 115 million under management. Just surviving for the last four years, I consider an incredible victory. Um, and it's fun. I mean, there's a lot of things that I think really are starting to work. and. Um, I do see scale, you know, not just the scale we've been able to do, but where it's headed, and that gets me fired up, and I really am excited about what I'm doing. Um, so, I mean, the basic ideas behind the model are, one thing we didn't talk about was levering up the opportunity to do online marketing, uh, customer acquisition. That's really, we've kind of only just started that piece. I think we really can do a lot more. So the growth hacking and kind of that, set of skill sets. We probably have about three or four people on the team, maybe five on occasion, and we would love to sort of like triple that next year. Um, that's probably a differentiated offering that maybe a few folks are doing, but not many. Chamath at uh, Social Capital, maybe a few other people are doing that, but not too many at scale. Um, so make a lot of little bets. Uh, general cost of building those companies in the first year or two is small. Uh, find companies that have already gotten past you know, at least some level of functional product and some level of early customer usage. Uh, try and look at unit economics and see if they might work out or whether they're working already. And then really the bet is on going from small to large. Like we think you know, functional product, early customer usage, 
possibly decent unit economics, and then do we get a chance to scale with at least you know, 10 to 20% of the portfolio? Um, and general historical trend looks like somewhere between 10 to 30% ends up getting to an exit, and probably somewhere between 5 to 15% ends up being a pretty decent return, and I would say decent better than 5x, maybe 10x. 1% uh, to maybe 2% looks like it has 40 to 50x potential, and data is still suspect on that. So like, I can't really say, even after 800 companies, you know, that we have definite predictability around the large stories, but we feel pretty good that we do. Um, so I don't really think that we're selecting for companies that are small exit. I mean, that's, I, I think Rob set up this somewhat, you know, fake differentiation between us and YC. I would say a lot of, a sim there's a lot of similarities between YC AngelList and us. Um, we're all going for a very large sample size. We know that big success happens infrequently and larger sample size probably lets us get a better shot at that. Um, Paul and Sam may describe their business as being a little bit more non-intuitive. I think the, the bigger differences between YC and 500 or more that they talk about really disruptive big models are things that look extremely strange and different. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that they're just as likely to find big successes from relatively mundane models. Uh, it's more just an exploration of the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur probably pivots a hell of a lot between the first iteration and where they end up. And so even whether it looks really crazy or not so crazy in the beginning, it's probably going to be a hell of a lot different down the road. So really, we're all just kind of working through, can we get a large sample size, filter for some level of intelligence? I think somebody said, you know, find some smart people who at least can continue standing up. Um, and at somewhere between, say, 1% to 15% of sample size, you're going to find some, some wins, hopefully some big wins. Um, I think there's an incredible amount of inefficiency in the traditional venture capital model. And I, I don't even think that we're being that radical in saying that now. A lot of people believe that. Um, the only argument is whether, you know, traditional VC who's standing up there can suggest whether they're in the top quartile or not on a consistent basis. But if you look at traditional VC funds that are in top quartile, that's usually the standard of excellence. Uh, can they do it three funds in a row? Probably less than 5 to 10% of VCs end up in top quartile consistently three funds in a row. So I would suggest to you that if you can't beat the market return three times in a row, you're a shitty venture capitalist and that model is shitty, uh, whether or not there's a few outliers, right? So, you know, betting on the asset class, right now I would say it's a really poor uh, choice assuming the traditional model and most of the LP community agrees with that. That's why it's so hard to raise money as a VC. Uh, you have to kind of prove that you have a differentiated model, you have differentiated deal flow, you're in the top quartile on a consistent basis and most people don't raise more than two funds. Um, so there's a lot of negative uh, sentiment in the traditional LP community around the venture model. Uh, and that's probably only gotten more so over the years. Uh, I think more recently, you know, in the last five to ten years, there's been a pretty huge shakeout uh, of people. Now it's starting to build back up again. But a lot of people got shaken out of the industry over the last five to ten years. And we were left with, I think, generally smarter folks in the industry and probably fund size with a few exceptions, is much smaller now, at least for new funds. Um, so we'll see. I, I, you know, whether our model, YC, AngelList, others, um, you know, really succeed, I think we're generally finding better practices and principles around uh, funding early stage uh, venture. Um, but most of what we're doing is trying not to model for unicorn success, it's trying to model for modest success. So what we want to be able to do is get a decent size win consistently and get unicorns inconsistently but some of the time. So that's why when we build the model, I don't know whether it's exhibit five or six, you'll see sort of three uh, types of wins. Uh, one's kind of a 5x win that I think we suggest happens 10% of the time. Uh, I think it's higher than that, but hopefully it's at least around 10%. Uh, a 20x win that maybe happens 5% of the time, that might be aggressive, but I think we can do that. And then a 40x win 1% of the time, and I kind of wanted to say a 50x win 2% of the time, so the numbers work better. Um, but those are kind of like the small, medium, and large wins. We think we're going to get a lot of the small wins, a good amount of the medium-sized wins, and a non-zero amount of the very large wins. 
uh, and we'll probably be okay if even only two of those three segmentations work in terms of exits. So when we kind of talk to our LPs about the model, we say we don't need unicorns, we expect to get a few of them, but we can make money without unicorns. If we find unicorns, we're gonna make a lot more money. Um, and that's kind of the pitch. The thing that I would say is I think we're not gonna ever lose money. I, I know that sounds a little aggressive, but I think we have a model that will probably generate uh, two to four X returns consistently and occasionally maybe the five X and possibly even the 10 X, although that's probably not super likely. Um, so it would be different if you could create a venture uh, capital firm that has consistent outperformance at the two to four X over a 10 year time frame. That's probably somewhere between a 15 to 20 percent uh, IRR, maybe even a little bit higher than that. Uh, and that would be an interesting asset class. So from an LP perspective, that, if you could tell me you could get consistent returns from venture and occasionally really good returns, I would probably start putting more money into that type of asset class. Rather than just saying, hey, I'm hunting thunder lizards or unicorns and I might get one every one or two or three funds, which I think is probably realistically the pitch that you're gonna hear from more traditional VC. Um, uh, one other point on kind of, you know, whether you think I'm authentic or whether you think I'm bombastic and all of that, some of it is for real and some of it is manufactured. Um, I would just say that looking at the traditional venture capital model and even looking at PG, who is a little different <laughs> than me, um, we just chose to not be that thing. So some of it is just competitive differentiation and choosing the brand and things are gonna go after. And so if we're gonna try and compete with YC, where would we find attack points? Well, they would be with women, they would be with international, they would be with minorities, they would be around marketing and distribution. We wouldn't try and beat them on white guys from Stanford or on engineering or on code, uh, but yes, there's a lot of little vulnerabilities that we went after. Now, just in the last year, Sam recently started saying, hey, we wanna go after you know, women and international too, and I was like, holy shit, we made Coke look over its shoulder, like that was fucking awesome. <laughs> like, I think he just called us Pepsi. Um, right? Um, but, uh, but yeah, we think about the world a little bit differently, and we want to be entertaining. Like, I mean, we want people to have fun with us. We don't think that we're less capable of providing value, we just think we're more fun in some ways. I mean, I'm not gonna write a better long essay than PG but I might include a couple of gifts that grab your attention differently than he would. <laughs> um, the international stuff I think is definitely uh, a really big opportunity. Um, and it's not just a competitive positioning. I really do think that um, most of the Silicon Valley market has just overlooked how big an opportunity the international stuff is and how fast it's coming up. Um, and I would kind of define that based on a couple of very simple parameters. Smartphone penetration, availability of online payments, uh, delivery and logistics. Um, those are kind of the nuts and bolts of is the population online, can they pay for stuff, and where there's physical delivery of goods, can I get it to them? Uh, there's some other pieces to it which are on the financial side, which is their availability of capital, particularly downstream capital, and are there availability of exits via the M&A market? That's probably the biggest risk of our international strategy is just there's a, generally a lack of M&A in a lot of uh, international markets. Uh, China is certainly having a lot more M&A happen now and Europe is a little bit, but outside those two sort of large markets, there's not a lot of M&A that happens internationally. Uh, but there is a lot of cross-border acquisition that's starting to happen. Uh, Baidu just bought a very large company in Brazil uh, called Peixe Urbano. Um, that's sort of an interesting set of behavior. And then offline companies uh, or generally non-tech companies are also buying their online counterparts. Um, so we think both of those trends will accelerate in international markets. But if you're just thinking five to 10 years ahead, where do you think the online mobile phone penetration, smartphone penetration is gonna be? Where do you think financial payments are gonna be? And where do you think delivery and logistics are gonna be? In most markets around the world, those three things will be a hell of a lot better in really short order, like three to five years in a lot of markets. And so the conditions for success, at least in consumer internet businesses, and I would argue SMB and enterprise not far behind, in some cases maybe even faster, those conditions are extremely similar around the world, uh, particularly in markets of maybe 100 million people or more, and you're already seeing it in places like Brazil, in Turkey, 
in Mexico, in Indonesia, in Thailand. Um, still early in a couple of those places, but certainly mature enough that even larger traditional VCs like Excel and Sequoia are starting to make big bets in those markets. Uh, certainly Rocket Internet is making big bets in a lot of those markets. So what I see happening is the international market adoption and evolution is happening much, much, much faster than either the entrepreneurial activity or the investor activity. That creates tremendous arbitrage, right? The rest of those international markets start to look very similar to the US and Europe, but there's nowhere near as much entrepreneurship and there's no near, near as much capital. Nowhere near as much capital creates some risk, but on par, I would say, I would love to be in a population of fewer entrepreneurs and fewer investors going after really big fucking markets that are maturing quite quickly. And we will have been in those markets for five years, maybe 10 years, before other investors decide that they're interesting and start jumping in. Hopefully, that creates a pretty substantial advantage for us down the road. Questions from the crowd? Yeah. Yeah, so you've raised six funds, um, all of which have a 20%. No, not completely, but yeah. Well, well not completely. Um, Actually, I can say that we are publicly fundraising for Fund 3 since we filed uh, for general solicitation. So if any of you are accredited and would like to invest in Fund 3, <laughs> please see Erin Lim right there. She's our Director of Investor Relations. Well, I was going to say that each of them at least it shows here that you have a net IRR of greater than 20%. But if you think we're not lying, yes. Yeah, if I believe evaluation methodology. Right. Um, and you also said that you're very selective, which is that you select less than 5 of the app, less than 5%. I don't know that we're very selective. Just on the accelerator process, you know, we have a sort of small funnel, uh, I mean, small filter percentage that gets into the class. Yeah, so I guess when I was reading the case, one thing that stood out to me is, like, the view is you're a VW, which if you look at your track record and also look at your selectivity, you would argue, like someone could argue that you're not. You know, so VW, I would probably and I would argue also say, we're a Honda in the 70s. Yeah. <laughs> and I would say that um, <laughs> the size of the funds, like. We got some accuracy coming about a decade out, maybe five years. And I know that you're still fundraising for fund three, mm -hmm. but I would expect this, just given the track record and given your selectivity, I would expect that size to be much bigger than what I saw in the case. So the, the IRRs you're saying? No, the size of the fund, the actual uh, amount yeah, of the fundraising. Yeah, we're kind of still shitty on fundraising. We've got to get better at that. And I'm just and the model's like what? really like different. And so uh, someone else was saying like the things that make us appeal to the entrepreneurs probably are risky on the LP side. And I would well, I was going to say, do you think that. that you have a, a marketing problem? With on the fundraising side, yep. Got to get past that. I think a lot of it is based on the returns for fund one. So we've had a pretty substantial amount of exits. So how, over 13 million in exits on a $29 million fund in just four years is damn good. Uh, we recycled most of that capital. We didn't send it back to, we gave 2 million back to investors. So we, we kind of doubled down and reinvested that back into companies. So that pushed out some of our timeframes on distribution. If we had returned 13 million, or at least let's say 10 of that to our investors already, we would be already quite doing extremely well in terms of returning a third of capital in just four years. So we probably need about two or three more years to really show the return kind of promise in fund one. Uh, fund two is better than fund one and fund three I think is dramatically better. We did some uh, shifting of the allocation to more accelerator companies in fund three. But yeah, that's cogent analysis, that's on target. We gotta get better at fundraising. Yep. Uh, I'm assuming one of the byproducts of kind of investing abroad and investing in sort of women, minorities, categories where like others aren't, yep. uh, is that you're going to see those folks eventually start to mentor uh, others with those affinities? Yeah, we're starting to get into second generation entrepreneurs now, just kind of recently. Okay. And are they um, coming back to invest in other uh, entrepreneurs? Or are they doing more of the entrepreneurial yeah. route again? I mean, I wouldn't say that our entrepreneurs have had so many exits in dollars that they're hugely um, net positive to invest money. Um, but there are a few now. Um, we have a few entrepreneurs now who are starting to get to multi-hundred million dollar exits and billion dollar exits. Uh, in general, I mean, it's not easy for individuals to invest in funds. They probably are more likely to invest in our companies than us fund directly. But we did have a, a strange phenomenon. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm forgetting the name of the company. Uh, Punched was a company that Google acquired mm -hmm. out of our first or second batch. I think first batch. Um, small exit, so five million bucks. 
uh, three entrepreneurs under 25 all made, you know, probably around million dollar paydays. Uh, and that acquisition happened really fast. It was in like two months after they got out of our accelerator. Uh, they actually invested a small amount of money in the same fund that they were out of. So I think we were like the only time anybody's ever gotten an exit and put money back into the same fund that they were part of. Um, but uh, yeah, I think in the future we're really going to try and start ramping up a lot of the folks who have exits to come back in. Uh, in fact, I've even thought about interesting model would be uh, to take 7%, but 2% is there, like theirs on account, but it has to go back into a future fund. So you kind of only take 5%, but their 2% has to be reinvested in a future vehicle. Um, it's a little bit like fascist, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> it could be cool. In back there. Um, I was just wondering how you think about businesses that come to you that are maybe outside of what you normally look for, like um, a skybox with like a lot of upfront capital or a healthcare yeah. company with longer sales cycles. Right. Like so we generally are risk averse on uh, large capex, which means we don't do a lot of um, hardware. Uh, we don't do a lot of stuff where there's like a lot of capital required in the front. I don't know medical device or just other economics. Um, we strangely do a lot of e-commerce even though that tends to be CapEx intensive in some places. Um, we're kind of getting more comfortable with hardware. We might get some LPs who are coming from that area. Uh, the combination of hardware and software. So hardware costs are coming down um, and hardware software combos kind of make that a little less capital intensive. Uh, the challenges with hardware that I think I worry about a lot, so not just CapEx intensive but long cycle time and with any physical product, you run the risk of distributors squeezing you from the profits. And if you're trying to do a hardware product that needs shelf space or needs distribution, then you're going to have to be at the mercy of people who are providing you those channels of distribution. So, um, However, I think there's some interesting opportunities to sell direct online with hardware that's not different than the other businesses we're involved in. So we might start doing more hardware where we're featuring the expertise we have in online marketing as one of the differentiators. Um, but yeah, our, our, you know, we're pretty risk averse. I know a lot of people think we're really risky, but most of our model is really pretty risk averse. Like after they got functional product, after they got early customer usage and revenue, uh, really just taking the risk that we take is a little bit on the unit economics and a little bit on whether it can scale up. So anything that's capital intense in the beginning or long cycle time on product is more risky, and we don't normally do it, but we like to dabble every now and then. Yes. Yeah, I think that's really attractive. It's different than what we do, but Betaworks and Science and Rocket and all of those things. So the uh, model that he's talking about is where the uh, VC or investing entity has a much greater stake in the company. The CEO probably has a much smaller stake in the company. Uh, and they build up, you, typically they're trying to build up operational capacity in some area that gives them an advantage to hit the market faster and hopefully solve the problem better. I think that's really smart and I think those models are extremely viable. Um, I know Mike Jones at Science is a really, uh, Science is a uh, operational company down in LA that's uh, uh, building businesses out kind of like a rocket in the US. Um, and they have a pretty substantial team that's doing growth hacking internally also. Uh, so they're another firm that I think has recognized that, that operational capacity of marketing, internet marketing internally is a big advantage. Um, and I would just comment more generally speaking that a lot of traditional VCs take a shit ton of capital home in their pockets and they're not reinvesting it in their company. And I think that's a big mistake. Um, and a few that don't do that, I would say Andreessen Horowitz has actually a pretty high staff ratio to sort of, I mean, obviously they're a much bigger fund, um, but pretty large number of people. Uh, first round capital also doing a lot of reinvesting of the capital into their platforms and companies. Um, so I have a ton of respect for people who are, you know, not taking the returns of their fund home in their pocket, either in management fees or in carry, and are reinvesting that into the people and products and services that they deliver. Because um, I think that you know, the services component of what we do uh, is a very big differentiator. And the more we pour into that, the more we can differentiate. Um, so I mean, I, I thought you know, I would normally have pitched that we actually have a higher partner to company ratio than YC by far, and that we would probably provide more 
of services. Actually, you know, again, selective data, but if you talk to some of the companies that are both YC and 500, they might actually tell you that we provide a little bit more time and attention, but you know, I'm biased on that remark. Uh, I would say we definitely provide differentiated like opinion um, skills in some areas that they might not, uh, but I'm trying to be competitive on that. Yes, Aria? Uh, you mentioned you regret not doing Uber. Can you explain oh, yeah. why given that you're Okay, so my new marketing angle is even though I didn't do Uber, we're still performing well. This proves the redundancy of my model, and even though I'm stupid, we're still going to make money. How's that sound? Perfect? Uh, my fundraising would be going a lot better right now if I'd just given Travis 100000 when he asked for it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Jesus Christ. What a, what a fucking mistake. Um, so Travis asked me to invest uh, in somewhere around 2000, late 2010 or early 11. I'm trying to remember. Uh, I think the valuation was at 10 or 12 million dollars. Um, he and the other uh, founder of Stumble Upon, Garrett Camp, uh, neither of them were running the company, so they had come up with the idea, found another entrepreneur to run the business, and I thought they were sort of being like rich playboys with a high valuation startup that they weren't going to pay that much attention to. The, the really frustrating thing is I was looking for an investment in transportation, and I had already done Lyft at FB Fund, and I had like registered this Wi-Fi towncar.com. I still have that domain if anybody wants it. <laughs> um, so I was looking for this combination sort of high-end service or better taxi service, and not just Uber, but also Lyft after they you know, sort of got in later stages, both asked me, and I didn't do either of them. Um, the only thing I can say is that I thought the $10 million valuation was a little high, and Travis wasn't running the company at the time. Those are both really bad excuses. Oh well. Yes. So I was actually really surprised by something similar, which is that on the um, like great exits in Fund One, it seems like the max invested was two twenty-five. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering why aren't you kind of doubling down harder on the ones that are are doing well yeah, when they're raising we, a series? We don't X? always have the uh, money, uh, so we've been sort of cash constrained in a lot of ways as we've been rate we've been. Raising and deploying capital really quickly, and we don't usually have a lot of money sitting around. And sometimes, you know, when the big deal has come, we just haven't had a lot of cash, uh, or we feel the pressure of not maybe putting a lot of cash in. On the flip side, we have written the big check every once in a while, and you know, kind of got our fingers burned on at least one or two of those cases. So I'm still trying to dial in like what's the right amount to double down on. Um, in general, the model that I think we're following now is kind of 100k in the first check probably 200K on the second check if we like the terms and the deal, and probably 400 or 500K on the third check. Um, the 100K check ideally is coming into Accelerator. It's between a one to three million dollar valuation. If it's at seed, it's probably between like four to seven. Uh, the second check is probably somewhere in the five to $10 million um, cap or pre-range, and that third check is probably in the 15 to 25 range. Um, and I could get into a lot more detail and follow on investment theory if you want to talk about that at some point. So we probably are trying to get a little bit more on the second and third check. But I will say that if you look at sort of the data, or at least my initial scan of the data, our first check is usually the best. I used to not think that. I used to think the second check was where we were going to make money. I used to think the second and third check was where we were going to make money. Uh, and it actually just has turned out that because the valuation is so much lower, on the first check we actually probably make the most return. Um, and I'll just give you the example of like there's kind of three cases, right? The first bet works and takes off really fast. The second bet works okay and it takes off modestly fast. And the third bet, uh, sorry, the first bet doesn't work at all or sucks. So in that last case, you're not going to make the bet. In the first two, you might choose to make the investment. <laughs> In the first case where growth really takes off, the difference in price jumps up quite a bit, probably by 3x, maybe even 5x or more, and it's hard for us to catch up. Right? If we're doing a 50 to 100k check and the price jumps up by 5x, now we have to write like a 250 to 500k check on that second bet. And the data may still not be amazing about whether that company's taken off. Uh, this happened to us with HomeJoy. We invested 50k at a 3 mil valuation. Um, 
Adora raised at a $7 million valuation, actually didn't ask us, unfortunately. She only asked Max and PG, uh, Max Levchin. But then they offered to let us invest at 12, I think. Uh, the company was doing a $1 million run rate at the time. And I was like, 12 is a little high for a $1 million run rate. And we were trying to do the math on like what's the right number. We were cash constrained at the time. We didn't end up doing it. About a year later, they were doing a $3 million run rate. They were raising at 45, right? And now we're looking at that like, holy shit, what's that going to be? Like, to kind of buy enough ownership again, it was going to be like a big fucking check. And we're looking at that $45 million valuation, a $3 million run rate. Like, that seems expensive. So the thing that happens is on the best deals, price runs away from you faster than you can catch up on ownership. On the medium-sized deals, that's actually where we sort of like to write that double-down check that's bigger because the market doesn't perceive as much progress in the company as we might actually hear. So a company that was like that was a company called Tradesy uh, that does used clothing. Uh, founder's a woman. Uh, she's in LA, so she's a woman in a non-Silicon Valley market in fashion, and at least two or three years ago, fashion commerce wasn't quite as hot as it was right as it is right now. So she raises a $4 million valuation first. I think we put 75K in there. Um, she raised, and the business was going well. She raised a $9 million valuation. We put 200K in there. Um, so price only jumped up about 2X, and our check size went up more than 2X. So we doubled ownership there. Um, the next point in time, she was competing with a company, uh, Poshmark, that was already raised a shitload of capital and was doing well. Um, they were actually doing sort of better in a lot of ways, but there was a perception in the market by the VC community that Poshmark was the big dog and they, you know, they would get to a long discussion with people, but they were like, eh, you're still fighting number one. Right? So she was having trouble <laughs> raising. This was like only about a year ago, maybe. Um, so we put 250K in at a 15 mil cap and we're ready to put another 250K in. And uh, in about a quarter, about three months, like the market turned around and all of a sudden she started getting a lot of term sheets and then she raised $12 million from Kleiner at a $40 million valuation in Q2, right? So we actually arbitraged the market's opinion on those other two checks and got a decent amount of ownership in the company when other people didn't think so. Now they're off to the races and they look like the fucking unicorn, except they didn't for their seed round and their bridge round and their A round. And so like, there is a lot of opportunity to invest in companies that are not oversubscribed before they really hit fucking stride and then price takes off, right? So I, I'm dwelling on this a lot just to kind of talk about, yes, we need to get better at the follow-on opportunities, but actually the, the opportunity to maximize ownership is probably happens more in the not clearly unicorn cases or before they're clearly unicorn cases. When you're, you have arbitrage of information on the rest of the investors in the market, you know that entrepreneur has their shit together. You know they solve some problems. For other people, they're just getting to meet them. And so they might not think it's hot as shit, but you know it's been de risked. You know they have their shit together, and you want to double down on that person. Um, got that? Yeah. So yes, we need to, need to double down and want to do more, but it's actually not in the hottest companies it's usually in the middling companies that eventually, hopefully, become hot. Yeah, sorry, I'm being uh, sexist about choosing women who ask questions. Um, so on that topic, you mentioned that racism is a good arbitrage mm -hmm. for community. I can't tell what your ethnicity is, but I'm wondering what- <laughs> White trash. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering what has made you take a stand on you know, looking for women-friendly, minority-friendly investments when it's obviously a very unpopular thing to do in Silicon Valley. I will try and do a little psychoanalysis here and say, I've been an underdog. I like to bet on underdogs. Uh, my mom was a mostly a solo parent um, and was also an entrepreneur. Uh, she's probably been the singular sort of example in my life of entrepreneurship. Um, and um, I'm, you know, I'm a white male, but probably in every other way that you would describe, I didn't go to Stanford, didn't like do all these other things that I think are kind of the more traditional path. So I identify with the number two spot or less than number two spots. So I like making that bet and winning that 
underdog bet a lot. Um, at the same time, I do think that you have a valuation arbitrage on anything that people think isn't the solid bet. And so that's anything non-white, anything non-male, anything non-US, uh, probably is underpriced. And so if we think we can actually, if we, if we are kind of believers that, yeah, you know, in general people are you know, smart equally, not based on racial or gender makeup, uh, then we kind of like to take that arbitrage bet all the fucking time. And it's a good marketing angle too, right? So I get, to, I get the double win, right? I get to invest in the undervalued asset and I get the marketing win out of it. And it's a differentiated take than YC and other people. So like, you know, it's a pretty good story for us to go after, at least as we're getting out of the gate. Uh, whether it pays off or not, we'll see. But it's a clearly differentiated bet. It's probably a clearly value-oriented bet. We had some early wins with women who are founders of companies, uh, Victoria Ransom with Wildfire. Um, I was a personal investor in SlideShare, Rashmi Sinha was a minority woman, international founder, that was the triple threat trifecta. Um, so we kind of just built up a reputation on that. Um, I wouldn't say it's you know, gonna be the strategy all the time, but we, we also bet on uh, couples. A lot of, there's a lot of VCs who don't like to bet on couples, either married or unmarried, and we had a couple of, a couple of couples wins early. So that was also an area we did a lot of. Um, just anything anti, I'll probably do for differentiation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think you are doing a great job for, for the environment, I mean, for, for the community, for entrepreneurs, but I want to- I just to want to like, make sure that that's clear. We're not doing this for charity. Yes, I do want to change the world, but I'm a greedy, blood-sucking, fucking venture capitalist, <laughs> and I plan to make money on all this shit. Yeah, so that, that, that was my question, how, how your economics looks like, because you have this office, yeah. you need to- Okay, yeah, so a little bit about the business model, which is different. So uh, this year, we will probably be on an eight to nine million dollar budget, only a third of which will come from management fees. That's quite unusual. Mm -hmm. uh, for a firm that has about 115 million under management, we have 40 people on staff. Most other VCs have no idea how we're doing that. Um, so about three million of the nine comes from management fees. About three million comes from our accelerator program tuition, somewhat controversial. We invest 100K in companies out of the fund. We take 25K of that 100 back as a program tuition cost to our incubator, which is a different entity. Uh, one of the reasons we don't do that transaction all in one is because uh, that's services revenue, and we can't mix the services revenue with the uh, fund structure. It would change the tax status, which would negatively impact our LPs. Um, but we do that because it actually generates a reasonable amount of cash for us to operate and run the business. Uh, we have much higher overhead probably, I would say, than YC or almost any other incubator. Um, I think our cost structure is probably around three million. We probably make about three million. So we are running the incubator program kind of break even, maybe slightly profitable, uh, but it's also sustainable. I think running incubators, at least with a reasonable team to company ratio, is very expensive and most people do not run incubators sustainably, um, unless you just have a big sugar daddy who's financing the cost either through grants. Um, if you actually want to run a resident program, so YC doesn't run a resident program, they do have space, but the companies don't live there. They just come in for uh, one-on-ones and for dinner. So we have all the companies live with us. We have a certain ratio that we think works. It's about 30 companies, about 100 people. That's the tribe size that we like. Um, and it's expensive, at least to run those programs in the Bay Area. We, we pay a lot of money in rent. Um, when we, we used to charge, we used to invest 50K and take 15K back. We recently, about a year ago, updated that to 100K, take 25K back, and it gave us a little bit more budget, so we increased the hiring on the staff. So I think we're, we're now in a place where we are, we're really unassailable on the incubator model. Uh, we've been running that for 10 cohorts now. Uh, we have a high you know, cost structure for that, but it's run sustainably. And so I think it's very tough for other incubators, even YC, to measure up against uh, the level of support and services that we deliver, and we have to pay for that. Um, but most people are not going to see returns for incubators three, five, seven years out. So trying to wait until you get returns to get the recovery of capital to make that sustainable is tough for most people. And we were one of the first ones, if not the very first one, that started to try and charge out of that structure. Um, 
Uh, the other thing we do is we run conferences and events and we have some sponsorships. So about another two to three million dollars comes from that part of our business. Uh, next year we're probably going to start an M&A practice and we may even run a fund with that. Uh, we think that will actually also help us get returns on the low end, uh, but we think that will drive a new revenue stream. We'll probably start doing recruiting at some point down the road. Uh, we're trying to look at like all the places where startups actually spend the dollars and start to offer the services that recover that capital. So we invest the money, figure out where they're spending the dollars, then start the services that recapture some of that money. That helps us build a break-even business in a lot of areas, and we can capture you know, more value, more brand, more deal flow, and hopefully uh, eventually get returns uh, out of that as well. So I would, I would call that full-stack VC, and we're trying to do a lot of that. And Jason's doing that kind of on the high end. Uh, maybe first round's doing that in the middle. We're kind of doing it at the incubator and seed level. Right, we have time for one more question. In the back, sorry. You're quoting in the case saying you want to be the Amazon of VCs. Yeah. And, and uh, you've talked about how big the market is. Does that branding work for you guys? I'm trying to like test that branding. <laughs> I was going to say Walmart to VC. It doesn't sound as... <laughs> <laughs> Amazon's not making any money. Amazon's not making any money? They're not choosing to make any profits. They're making a shit ton of cash. The company is a hell of a lot more valuable than it was several years ago. If you were an investor in Amazon, you would be making money on your investment. Short it. You would short it. Like, well, OK. The market can stay crazy longer than you can stay short. <laughs> Travis, what was your question? Um, Sorry, just to like get to the thing. I, this is actually something we're trying to position as new branding right now. Like everybody's sort of asking us, "Well, you're already at 800 startups. Aren't you going to change the name?" And like, no, because like the positioning we're starting to go to now is 500 VCs. So actually, I don't think we're even going to be competing with. Uh, you actually included the crazy slide that has all the numbers for how big the market is. So we're starting to see ourselves not uh, just servicing the entrepreneur with capital. We're actually starting to shift a little bit into servicing the budding investor, venture capitalist, accelerator manager, whatever, and trying to teach them like, how do you do large sample size investing and what are the services that entrepreneurs need. So I would rather be in the business in the long term of providing education and capital to investors who then in turn provide that capital to entrepreneurs. Um, so we're starting to have a model where our regional funds actually have GPs who keep 80% of the carry and uh, management fees, and we keep 20% of the management fee and carries as our overhead. And it's a little bit of a franchise model, but what we're trying to do is uh, attract talent. I mean, hopefully we make the case that if you were a first-time VC starting out, you know, we're, it's better for you to come to us and give us 20%, you'll keep 80%, and we'll help you with all the back office, getting up to speed, you can borrow our brand and get started. And then the benefit to us is the investments that you make, uh, we might get to participate in on the first check. Certainly on the follow-on, we would come in and follow with you out of the main fund. Um, and this is kind of the exact experience that I had working with Founders Fund was as a first-time VC, I got to write a lot of small checks, uh, which was incredibly awesome. The normal situation when you join a VC fund is probably you don't get to make any decisions for the first five years, if ever, and you're doing a lot of grunt work trying to help other people uh, and I'm getting the hook, can't you tell? <laughs> I just want to make sure we f finish Travis's question. Yes, sorry. So you and your personality are very tightly linked with the identity of the uh, company. Yep. So with those scale ambitions in mind, yes. I'd like to ask you a question you would ask of, of one of your companies. How do we scale? Can this really scale? And yep. Is there a five-year startup without you? Uh, it's a great question. About four years ago, Mitch Kapoor, who's one of our investors, challenged me to say, you need to make 500 bigger than you. Uh, right now, if you look at the Twitter follower count for 500 startups, uh, I'm at 242 or 3,000. Uh, the company's at about 239,000. They're going to pass me in the next 30 to 60 days. Uh, that's an imperfect metric. Uh, <laughs> but I would say there are people who know 500 that don't know me or don't know me as well. Uh, we have 13 people making investments for the companies. Um, a lot of other people on the team uh, have more knowledge in other areas. Uh, I'm probably making less than 30% of the investment decisions now for the fund, and most of the accelerator batches are run without me. So if you really dig in, I'm still the face from a speaking point and from a fundraising point, but the operational uh, 
uh, elements of 500, and to some extent, even the brand elements of 500 are not based on me. One of the great things about writing this case is that Yin and I got to spend a lot of time seeing this day. You know, not just the, the, the showman, but telling <laughs> us about how he's running the business and this, the thinking behind it. And so I actually think that's what's the most exciting thing about what we got to see today. So ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in thanking David. <laughs>